Well, Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you just for the time we've experienced so far, just celebrating you, lifting your name in song, Lord, looking to you for our answers and our comfort and our peace and our strength, looking to you as the author and finisher of our faith, looking to you, Lord, as the one that hears our prayers and knowing that we pray to you, Lord, because you're the one with the power to change these things. And so often, Lord, what we find as we pray is that you change us first. And so, Lord, we continue now with a heart of prayer and a heart of praise and a heart of worship, Lord, as we open your word. We ask you would speak to us, Lord. Guide us through it by your light. And, Lord, just let your spirit move mightily and have his way with us today. So we turn this time over to you, Lord. Yield to your purposes. We pray and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 68, it's a little longer than some of the psalms we've seen recently, and it's a complicated psalm. Um, It's complicated because it seems that many men over the years, commentators, have taken different paths in explaining it. One old-time commentator that I'm kind of fond of said that this was the most difficult of all the psalms. I don't know if I agree with that, but we're going to spend some time moving outside the psalm so that we can put it within context of where these events were taking place in the Hebrew scriptures. So we're going to move around a lot, and I just encourage you just to ask the Lord to help you listen, because it'd be kind of difficult to move to all these different places I'm going to share. Um, So let's just dive in. We see the typical introduction that we've seen so many times prior to the chief musician always with the question, is that actually a worship leader at David's time who we turn these things over to to lead, or is the chief musician God himself? And I say we could probably settle on both sides of that fence. Again, it's a psalm of David, and for the third time, I think, now in a row, not only do we see psalm, but we also see song. And uh, just kind of speaks of both the instrumental and the lyrical um, of, of what we got before us. Let's take a look at the first few verses. It says, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those also who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad, let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. So we start off with an Tense, I believe, first verse, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those also who hate him flee before him. Now David, in his thinking, I have to believe, was not just speaking from his own heart in the moment, but also David looking back. He was looking back to Israel's exodus from Egypt and the journey from Egypt to the promised land. And that really is a large part of our context with this psalm. In Numbers chapter 10, verse 33 and following, we read, So they departed from the mountain of the Lord on a journey of three days. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them for the three days journey to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was above them by day when they went out of the camp. So it was whether the ark set out that Moses said, rise up, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you. So you can see David quoting Moses. And why would he be quoting Moses? Because a similar event was taking place. And that's what the Psalm speaks of. But I think one of the things important to see is that when God goes forth, no enemy can stand against him. I think we need to remember that. I think we need to tell each other and ourselves that every day. That when God goes forth, no enemy can stand against them. Because I think so many, even those in the faith today, are losing part of that belief. Because the darkness encroaches on all of us. Things become more difficult. I would say even confusing. And because God's not the author of confusion, I have to believe that the enemy is moving very strongly now and really speaking into all our lives, whether you think you're lending your ear to him or not. But he does it through the events and some of the strangeness that we see. 
So Moses spoke those words when the Ark of the Covenant led Israel from Mount Sinai. And David used the same phrasing when the Ark began its journey to Jerusalem, which would be its final resting place. And so let's look at the scene there. We read the scene of what's taking place, what this psalm is pointing to in 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. And it says again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from the, there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. So I believe most of us are familiar what the ark of the covenant is, if not by Bible reading, probably by some movie which probably had the whole narrative wrong. But I just want to make you understand and so that you'll be clear that the Ark of the Covenant was of no design of man. It was no desire of man to build it. That it was a direct mandate by God that it would be built all the way down to its design, its size. And so let's read where that word of God was given about what was to be built And we find that in Exodus chapter 25, beginning in verse 10. It says, And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. Now, a cubit, we learn, really has two measurements. The common cubit was 18 inches. They talk about a royal cubit, which was 22 to 24 inches. We'll stick with the 18 inches. So not a very big box. Carrying on now, and you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it and shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of the one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall be stretched out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. And so we know, I think most of us know, that 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 ark of the covenant was placed into, eventually, into the temple, into the area of the temple that was known as the Holy of Holies. And there the high priest each year would go in, on the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of the nation of Israel. Now talk twice in those words about the testimony that God would give to put into. And pretty confident that what we would find in the ark if we were to look in there today would be the tablets of the Ten Commandments were written on by the finger of God. A jar containing some of the manna that God used to feed the Israelites in the desert, and the rod, the rod of Aaron, the rod of Moses, the one that was used in the presence of Pharaoh to show the power that God has. So we know before Jesus died on the cross, the Holy Spirit did not position himself in the hearts of believers. That wasn't the relationship 
in the Old Testament times. The Holy Spirit moved on, po on, the, on, the, on the population of the world in general. He came upon people for power, but that relationship of him residing in a believer was not yet given. Now today, believers have the Holy Spirit and are continuously in the presence of God and can call on him any time. But again, the Israelites didn't have that luxury. So the Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence. So as with Moses in the Exodus, David in the land of Israel expressed the need of God's people, his confidence in God, when he said, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those also who hate him flee before him. And when I read those words, I think to myself, how fitting for believers today to see those words as a prayer. We could say, Jesus arise, let your enemies be scattered, let those who hate you flee before you. And when we, through the picture that David paints, see the display of God's fierce presence, we are assured that his enemies have no chance. I mean, right now, on some days, depending on what you're looking at, what you're reading, what you're hearing, it could seem that the enemies of God and God's people are having a heyday that they're being very successful. You know, the image I've always had in my mind, I mean, literally from the earliest times of even being a believer, reading through scripture and thinking about the end time and how strong the enemy would become in the last days, I always had that picture in my mind of, and for some of us it's becoming a forgotten item, the old incandescent light bulb. How many of you have seen an incandescent light bulb get really bright right before it blows out? That's how I kind of see what, where we're at right now. The light of the enemy, which is a false light, is getting brighter and brighter, but all it's going to do is come to its end. It's eventually going to blow out by the power of God. But we have to hold on to that belief. We have to believe we believe that because I think we're getting challenged. We read here that God's enemies disappear like smoke and are melted like wax at his fiery presence. And for all this, the righteous, God's people, are to be glad, it tells us. God's people are to take all this in and rejoice before God. And it says to rejoice exceedingly is what it means in the Hebrew. Let's pick up in verse 4. Sing to God, sing praises to his name, extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. So we read, encouraged again, as we've been now for weeks, to praise, to sing to God, sing praises to his name. And again, I emphasize how important his name is. You know, Psalm 145, verse 21 says, My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. You know, the scriptures give us many names for God. We've done studies on that before. Each of those names, I believe, opens up a glimpse for us into his character, into understanding his attributes. And you know what? If you were to read this psalm from the Hebrew, you would be blown away by how many names and how many times God's name is spoken of. As a matter of fact, if you read this psalm in the Hebrew, you would see that his name Elohim is mentioned 23 times. And we would see Jehovah, or the short form of Jehovah, Yah, spoken of here. Kind of the way you could think of that, we say hallelujah. That's his name there. And Adonai, another of his names, used six times in this psalm. And there's even Shaddai. Sometimes we see El Shaddai speaks of his greatness, of his power, his almightiness. And then in verse 4 here we read, extol him who rides on the clouds. Now that can seem pretty obscure. Now the Amplified Version of the Bible and many other versions better translate this verse from the Hebrew. And in that translation it says this, it says, Sing to God, sing praises to his name, 
lift up a song for him who rides through the desert. So it's a picture of an ancient monarch and his entourage approaching a town with the inhabitants clearing away all the obstacles on the road for their arrival. You know, that takes me to a place in Scripture that I'm very fond of, and we see part of it repeated in the New Testament. And that's Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 3. And there we read this, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted Every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so I think that's a very elaborate way of thinking about this, about making sure that the way of God is clear. And I think every one of us has that responsibility for ourselves. Because in ourselves we have valleys that are caused by this life that are too low. All of us have obstacles like high mountains that have become too high. We have crooked places in our lives that should be straight. And I think sometimes it's our effort that counts by the power of God in us to bring those high places low, to bring the low places high, to make the crooked straight so there is no obstacle for God to come. And we know these beginning words of what I just read. We heard it come out of the mouth of the prophet about the one that would welcome the Lord. John the Baptist who welcomed the Lord into the Jordan River, baptized him as the Lord requested. He was the one crying in the wilderness and he was preparing the way for the Lord. You know, in like fashion, Israel was told to make way for the arrival of God, to remove all that would hinder his approach and to extol him. Now that word extol is very interesting. In its basic definition, it means to mound up or to lift up. And we can understand that, to mound up or to lift up as far as our response with God, to give him his due, his place. But you know what's really interesting is when you look at the root of the Hebrew word that's translated as extol, it actually means the act of constructing a road or highway. So it just lays out where to extol, where to make that way for the Lord. Now, does the Lord need us to make a way? No, because he can, metaphorically, kick his way into our lives anytime he wants. doesn't matter how many obstacles we lay up. But when there are obstacles, very often I think he allows us the time to recognize it, to repent of it, and then to remove them, which is part of the repentance, so that he has a clear shot into our lives. So David reminds us that God is infinitely high but he's also intimately near to those who are friendless and to those who are dispossessed. As the God of all grace, he is the father of the fatherless, we read. He's the defender of widows. He provides the warmth and fellowship of a happy home for the lonely and as for those who have been unjustly condemned to prison. He leads them into prosperity with shouts of joy, we read, but with the rebellious. He says it's a different story. They are consigned to a desolate wilderness, dry places as it's put here. Let's look at verse 7. O God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, Selah, the earth shook. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You, O God, sent a plentiful rain whereby you confirmed your inheritance When it was weary, your congregation dwelt in it. You, O God, provided from your goodness for the poor. So here we see when the Israelites broke camp at Sinai and started their journey toward the promised land with the ark leading them, it was an emotion-packed moment. I mean, nature itself seemed to enter into the awesomeness of the event. The earth quaked. The heavens broke loose with rain. Mount Sinai shuddered at the sight of God on the move with his people following. And we see this imagery in the book of Judges in chapter 5. And chapter 5 is known as the Song of Deborah. And in there we read these words, Judges 5, beginning in verse 3. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. 
I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you went from Seir, which is another word for Sinai, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured. The clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord, this Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. Let's pick up in verse 11. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those who proclaimed it. Kings of armies flee, they flee, and she who remains at home divides the spoil. Though you lie down among the sheepfolds, you will be like the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scatters kings in it, it was white as snow in Zalman. So here we see a picture of Israel entering the promised land and conquering it. And the Lord had spoken of this victory. The verse 11, we read, the Lord gave the word. And so what was that word? Well, we read the word that God gave in Exodus chapter 23, beginning in verse 20. And this is what God said. He said, behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you in to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fill the number of your days. I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the sea, Philistia, and from the desert to the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. There's quite a picture of how the Lord was going to prepare how he was, them, how he was going to lead them, how he was going to take care of the enemies for them, how he would use the enemies' dwellings to become theirs. But I think it's real important before we move on just to think about what I just read and see God's timing. God was going to do all of that, but he said I would do it gradually because he didn't want the land to become fallow. He didn't want things to become spoiled for them. So he did it gradually. And I think so many times when we're desperate in our prayers and we want things to happen quickly, we don't see the wisdom of God in it happening gradually because he's making sure that you'll be left with something healthy in the end, something that will prosper you. And sometimes that takes a while. And I know patience isn't the greatest virtue of most believers, but it needs to be when we see how God's hand works so this is what verse 12 of our psalm spoke about. Kings of armies flee, they flee, and she who remains home divides the spoil. Now, verse 13 and 14, they're rather difficult. And it's amazing how many different ways I saw them explained. And I'm going to explain in one way, and hope I'm correct. Um, I think it's a, it's a valid um, point. But let's read those. Though you lie down among the sheepfold, you will be like the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow in Zalman. 
So God's people coming from humble circumstances often had nowhere greater than the sheepholds in which to rest their heads, but no less were their victories in God over their enemies. They were blessed by the Lord's grace, covered by the spoils of victory, both silver and gold. And the snowy conditions alluded to in verse 14, well, that may have hindered their enemy and assisted in their victory. That's as clear as an explanation of those two verses as I can get. Zalman, if you went to Israel today, um, there's a mount there, not very great in size, but Mount Arbal, Arbal, I think is the name of it. Um, we got to go up and sit up there and worship on top of that when I visited Israel. Um, look at verse 15. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? This is the mountain which desires to do, God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. So Jerusalem was still held securely by the pagan Jebusites when David and his forces arrived. And the first thing David did after he'd been anointed king over all Israel was to move against the city. The defenders were smugly satisfied that it was so impregnable that it could be defended by the blind and the lame. But David and his men captured the stronghold and they called it the city of David. And we read about that in 2 Samuel chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. It says, And all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over it, over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel and be the ruler over Israel. Therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come here. But the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking, David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Now David said on that day, whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore they say the blind and the lame shall not come into the house then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David, and David built all around from the Milo and inward. Now look at verse 15 and 16 again. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you fume with envy, you mountains of many peaks? This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. So as the citadel's capture reveals Jerusalem as the chosen city, the high snow summit of Mount Hermon, located north of Bashan, looks enviously down at Mount Zion. Now if you go to Israel today and you go up in the northeast corner, there is a mountain called Hermon, and it is the tallest peak in Israel, about 9,000 feet. It's actually ski. You can actually ski up there. A lot of things I'd like to say about Mount Hermon this morning, but I won't go into it, but the picture is this great peak, the greatest in the area, was looking down with envy upon Jerusalem, which sits at about 4,000 feet, for what it meant to God, for what it would house, the city of David, the ark that was on its way, the temple, and then someday in the seat of David, the Lord Jesus, as he reigns and rules over the earth. Look at verse 17 of our psalm. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them in Sinai, as in Sinai, in the holy place. So David recalls the capture of Jerusalem from the Jebusites, and he has no illusions as to the real source of victory. It was not his clever strategy. It wasn't the valor of his men. It was the numberless chariots of God that were assaulting the city. The march of God that had begun in Sinai had now reached a glorious finale at Zion. 
You know, when we read that verse, and we'll read it again, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them. As in, I'm reading that from the King James, I'm sorry. just wanted you to see the difference. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them and is in Sinai in the holy place. So it's kind of a mysterious wording in the English because you would think, well, 20,000, I mean, that's a lot, of, but why is that impressive? But then it says even thousands of thousands, or in the King James, thousands of angels. So I believe what we're seeing is this incredible f- spiritual force, this m- army of God that was there to make this happen for his people. It's a mighty display of God's power. And again, that's why Herman, Mount Hermon looks jealously, jealously at Zion. Now, looking into the wording that was used in the Hebrew, it gets to me rather interesting. When it's talking about God's chariots, and you look and it says 20,000, but you go into the Hebrew and you understand the word that's used there can mean 20,000. But more importantly, the most detailed definition is the word myriad. Myriad. Which means an indefinite large number. Innumerable. And so, interesting, the scribes would pick 20,000 when this is the scene that was being displayed. And if you, like me, are thinking, it reminds you of another thing that happened, another scene. And that's a, a story that's told in 2 Kings. And it says this in 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning verse 14. It says, therefore he sent, who's he? He is the ruler of Syria. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God, Elisha, speaking of Elijah, servant of the man of God, arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And so he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And so I believe that's the scene we see unfold here for Jerusalem, for Zion, as God arrives back there again in the form of the Ark of the Covenant. Look at verse 18. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. So as David remembers how his soldiers had stormed the heights of Jerusalem, he looked beyond flesh and blood to see God's ascending, God ascending the high mount, taking captives, winning spoils of victory for those who were former rebels so that he could dwell among them as their Lord and Savior. Now those words may have rang familiar to you. The Apostle Paul applies verse 18 to the ascension of Jesus. He does so in Ephesians chapter 4. When Jesus ascended from the earth to heaven, he led captivity captive, we read there. That is, he triumphed gloriously over his foes and gave gifts to men. And the gifts he received among men were the reward for his finished work on the cross. But he turned around and gave those same gifts to men for the establishment and expansion of his church. Look at verse 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation, Selah. Our God is the God of salvation, and to God the Lord belongs, escapes from death. But God will wound the head of his enemies, the hairy scalp of the one who still goes on in his trespasses. The Lord said, I will bring back from Bashan, I will bring them back from the depths of the sea, that your foot may crush them in blood, and the tongues of your dogs may have their portion from your enemies. Now, the Amplified Version of the Bible translates verse 19 this way. It says, Blessed be the Lord who bears our burden day by day, the God who is our salvation. So David's memories of capturing Zion awaken in the praise of God. And this psalm represents God as both deliverer and destroyer. As deliverer, he bears our burdens and he wins us the victory. 
He's the God of salvation, and he has the power to deliver from death. As destroyer, we read here, he'll crush his foes. And he's promised to track them down with the wilds of Bashan and from the coast, the high seas, so that Israel can wash its feet in their blood. And we also read, so Israel's dogs can feed on their carcasses. Look at verse 24. They have seen your procession, O God, the procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. There we have the picture of the ark being brought in to its resting place. The singers went before, the players on instruments followed after. Among them were the maidens playing trembles. Bless God in the congregation, the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There is little Benjamin, their leader, the princes of Judah and their company, the princes of Zebulun and the princes of Naphtali. So after David captured Jerusalem, he arranged for the ark to be brought to a tent which had been erected to house it. We look at that scene from 2 Samuel verse 6, or excuse me, chapter 6, verse 12. It says, Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Odeb Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Odom Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. I love that. The reverence to the presence of God, to that ark of the covenant which represented him and his presence. They only took six steps in their procession and stopped and made sacrifices to God. I think at that moment they were just so overwhelmed on what they were on their way to do, what they were involved in. It goes on, it says, Then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod, which means it didn't cover much. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting with the sound of the trumpet. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw David King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. She wasn't proud. But man, we can't fault David, can we? Leaping and dancing in the presence of God. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among all the multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone, a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. Now this procession that we just read about is described here in this psalm. As the ark moves towards the sanctuary, the psalmist says, in effect, look, here he comes. The choir is leading, the band brings up the rear, and in between are the young women playing trembles. And listen to the song they're singing. Bless God in the congregation, the Lord from the fountain of Israel. The tribes are all represented from those in the south, little Benjamin and Judah, to those in the north, Zebulun and Naphtali. Brings us to our final verses, verse 28. Your God has commanded your strength. Strengthen, O God, what you have done for us. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring presents to you. Rebuke the beasts of the reeds, the herd of bulls, with the calves of the people, till everyone submits himself with pieces of silver. Scatter the people whose delight in war. And envoys will come out of Egypt. Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hands to God. So this is sort of a closing prayer, and the prayer calls on God to summon his might, to show his strength again on behalf of his people, to complete what he'd begun for them. And this prayer will finally be answered, we know, in the millennial kingdom, when the temple will be the glory of Jerusalem, and when the kings will bring presents of gold and frankincense to the great king, Jesus sitting on the throne of David. Now the Hebrew of verse 30 is obscure. Reeds were often associated with the Nile River. So perhaps David prayed that God would keep them safe against the Egyptians and the Ethiopians, asking God to do that until they, like all the nations, come in submitted tribute to Jerusalem. 
And in that day, envoys from Egypt will bring tribute. Ethiopia will stretch out her hands imploringly and adoringly to the king of all the earth. And I said final verses too soon. Verse 32, sing to God your kingdoms of the earth. Oh, sing praises to the Lord, Selah, to him who rides on the heaven of heavens, which were of old. Indeed, he sends out his voice, a mighty voice. Ascribe strength to God, his excellence is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. O God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. Now these closing verses encourage the the nations of the world, really, to recognize God's eventual, total, and complete triumph. What a great thing if all the nations of the earth were to recognize that, that what God has promised, what his word says, is inevitable. And David seems to say, with such inevitability awaiting us, why not worship him now? I say that he would probably say that to his people as well. The nation should recognize and surrender to God's strength. David knew that the land into which God had guided them and to which they now dwelled with his people was great but not in great and awesome as God himself. The Amplified Version says that God is profoundly majestic. I love that term. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. And really, when you read all of this, all we could say in response is what the psalmist ended the psalm with, three words. Blessed be God. Blessed be God. You know, I found an irony along with the difficulty in this psalm. And the irony is that for the Israelites, in a sense, God was in a box. God was in a box. And for believers today, God dwells in his people, literally takes up residence in their heart. And yet here we are in the year 2024, And it seems that the church at large has put God in a box. We've decided his dimensions. I think we've even taken liberty with how often we'll open and let him out. And I think it's too bad because God doesn't dwell in a box. So why should we put him in a box? Why should we limit him? Why should we try to even define his dimensions when he is dimensionless? You know, we're told that God is omnipotent, all power, all powerful. But we've made him something less than that. We really have, and I I know we have, because the things of this world are closing in on us, and they're affecting us greatly. Maybe someone here sitting here today says, no, I'm not affected by it. God bless you for that. But we got to make sure that God, the God we worship, is not in a box. And if he's in a box, if you've kept him there, then I, I just implore you to open the box. Open the box. Don't try to define God any longer other than what he's told us about himself from Scripture. I mean, think about the picture here that God led them. God went before them. And yes, he was represented by that physical box that they carried on acacia poles, gilded with gold. And God was able to put a display of his power that was just, well, it's hard to imagine. I mean, our language just doesn't really capture it as much as I believe it probably would look to us if we were there. So I have to ask the question of myself and of you. I mean, is God done displaying his power? Can he not go forth and lead us in the same manner in which he led them? Is he not leading us in those ways? And are we just failing to see it or believe in it or have faith that it will happen? I don't know. I mean, there was a, a prayer this morning, you know, for leadership and for the ones that Either you hope or you like or you want to be that leader someday, you know, and I'm, I'm personally done with that. I mean, whatever the Lord does, he does. 
because it's beyond me to conceive of how the next 11 months are going to go. But why are we waiting for a man to lead us? Maybe we need to crawl out of that box too. I mean, I've, I, I'm just going to share my personal feelings. I mean, I've been disgusted by the worship of men. I've been disgusted by the worship of a man. He's not going to save us. There's no political solution to politically created problems. Only God can do that. So if you want to elect somebody, elect a God. Make him your God, your king, your president, whatever you need him to be. Because he can do all of it. No man is going to save us. You know, there's that old cliche, I've read the end of the book, I know how it ends. And then we, even arrogantly there, we say, we win. No, God wins. It's up to us to be on his team. And if I'm going to be on his team, then I need to recognize him as my captain. So we need to put him first and just get beyond the political nonsense. Stop putting our hope in the system. Stop putting our hope in men. And maybe even listen to them a whole lot less. Because what we're witnessing is theater. It's the theater of the absurd. And all of our energy is going into it. All of our attention is being stolen by it. And in essence, it doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean a thing. Because no one's going to do anything that God isn't going to allow them to do. And his purposes are perfect and they will come to fruition. And so let's recognize that God's not in a box anymore. But let him be the one who leads us out. And really, in a great sense, in the same direction, we're being led into the promised land. We're being led into the promised land. We're being led into his presence in a time that will come after this chapter of the earth is closed. And then we will go and we will worship and we will serve with him in Zion upon that hill. Nothing but glory ahead. Unfortunately, we got to go through the valley of the shadow of death to get there. So look up, friends, look up. Worshiping and ushers can come back. You know, the people of the earth, the powers that be in the day of Jesus, they tried to put him in a box. We call it a tomb. We call it a tomb. You know, it's interesting when you think about the tomb. We always marvel that, he, that the rock that covered the tomb's entrance was rolled back. And yet, just moments later, we see Jesus walking through walls. So Jesus didn't need the rock rolled back in order to get out. No. The stone covering of the door to the tomb was rolled back so that we could kneel down and look in. And you know, when you go to Israel and you go into Jerusalem and you go to the place, one of the places, but the place mainly that they say was the tomb, or not, you know, the tomb in which he was laid, which I don't know, I had a feeling when I was there that that actually may be a, it's in a horrible position now with everything that's built up along it. Had the face of the skull, Golgotha, right there, and unfortunately that fell in a rainstorm some years ago. But what, I, what it was caught my eye was the fact that when you went into the tomb, <laughs> even somebody as short as me, had to watch their head. You had to bow to get in. And so when we come into God's presence, let's make sure that that's what our heart does. We bow before our king. Because he opened the tomb so that we could see him. He would not be boxed in. His power came forth and it still reigns and rules over the earth for those that believe in him. And so let's be thankful that we're those that believe in him. And of course we take our time in communion because that's how he got there. You know, he shed his blood, his body was broken for us, and he did something to honor his father and to 
save us. And so we come into this time and we spend time remembering that, celebrating that, giving him all the praise, glory, and honor that he's due for that. So that's what this time is about, and I pray you take full advantage of it. And then remind yourself that he is your king. Remind yourself that he's not in a box. Remind yourself that he is above all, in all, and through all. So Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the great illustration of your power going forth, of how you lead your people, Lord, how you care to lead your people, and that you'll lead them into goodness, and the journey won't be easy for us. It wasn't for them. Lord, so many of us stand at the perimeter of the promised land, Lord, and we shudder because there's giants in the land. And so, Lord, let us see you as the one that slays giants. You would take the obstacles, Lord, away. And, Lord, don't let us forget that we have a responsibility in removing the obstacles that we've placed in our own lives that block us from you. And so, Lord, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time just to come together with you to worship and to praise and to listen to you speak. And now we come into this time to honor you, Lord, to remember, to celebrate your sacrifice, your raising from the dead as you promised, Lord. And for all the hope we have and all the promises that have been fulfilled and the very few that still need to be. And we know you will. So we praise you this day. We give you all honor and glory. We do so in Jesus' name.